Hey, everyone. How is Zurich this fine afternoon? Uh, it looks nice from the window. <laughs> I haven't been out, actually. I've been cranking away on things. Um, I, I talked to Hank briefly just a, a short while ago, and I'm, I'm still finishing uh, editing a radio show that I have to send over to the radio station. So I'm slightly distracted uh, checking in, but um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, get into it. Sounds it's great. Good to see you on the Polis group as well. Yeah, that was it. <clears throat> it was interesting. I just in re reflecting a little bit, I was kind of surprised that there isn't a quick way to understand what polis is. That there's no like, hey, here's thirty minutes you can invest and you'll be like, yeah. way savvy. Uh, um, Peter and, and Hank, polis p o l dot i s is a citizen platform uh, that was was created by a group called V Taiwan in uh, actually in Seattle, I think. Actually, Polis is, is from Seattle, right? I don't think it was actually created by V Taiwan. Yeah, I think they I, I, might be the, the first or most notable use case um, <clears throat> partner organization. Um, it's Carl, Colin McGill, and I, I think is the main founder, and then I forgot exactly who else. And now it's Liz Berry, who's come in more recently, who we're working with, um, with through Tom Atlee's circle. Um, and she's and basically the, the way she put it actually um, a couple of things were interesting we can come back to about last night but um, so she's heading up the nonprofit which is the new company of Polis it sort of failed as a for-profit as she put it and um, so now they're going in this nonprofit direction which I'm just hearing about hey Lauren and um, what else yeah I think that's the main thing so it's kind of between and Colin actually wasn't there yesterday although he was on the previous week so he's sort of in the mix um, on hand. They're doing a, a bunch of things on the ground in Minneapolis, for example. It's just, um, taking a lot of energy. But I think they want, they definitely want our feedback and need it. And there's sort of particular ways I think that they're hoping to we get involved. Yeah. Yeah. And just to catch everybody up, um, we're talking about a call that I joined yesterday that's, that's been going a couple times before that hosted by a guy named Tom Attlee, who is a world-class genius in democratic participation uh, about a platform called Polis, P-O-L dot I-S, uh, which is being used in Taiwan for a project called V Taiwan and Gov0, G0V dot org, I think. Uh, and they're basically, it's a high functioning uh, democratic participation platform where people can inform decisions better. Uh, and it's clearly a, a kind of a community that we would love to to bring into the conversations here. So trying to figure some of that out. And I was trying to figure out, is this a platform we should be using in some way for some of the work we're doing? How does it fit? Um, but the conversation had a, had a big piece of half the people didn't really know what the platform was or, or it, it was like the three blind men and the elephant, but nobody had touched the elephant really yet. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that. I think there was a... Um kind of subgroup on the email thread that, that where it was highlighted that actually we're so far a community of interest and we can't be a community of practice because we don't know what to do with the thing. A couple of them of us do, us, we, uh, Andy Pace, the notable person in London who's been working with it in the communities there with the, with the, the mayor in this area, uh, for example. Um, and I think Tom has a lot of insight, but more just from looking into it and not really using it so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so the tutorial is in the mix. I think that's coming. And that was another takeaway from, from yesterday. And I'll do a tiny, and I'm like really interested in there being a, a simple tutorial for this thing. I'll just do a little brain sharing. One of the key people in this project, uh, the project is kind of yeah, V Taiwan I mentioned. Uh, let me, there we go. So here's V Taiwan and here's the Gov project that started in 2014. Uh, and, there, and, and Audrey, there we go. So here's GovTech Power Tools for Discourse, came out of the, student, the Sunflower student movement back when. So I don't remember if you remember the protests that were happening uh, called the Sunflower Movement. Uh, but there sort of showed up this thing called V Taiwan that then was using the platform Polis. So here's that. Um, and Audrey, is in the middle of this and she joined me along with a colleague named Shu Yang Lin for this call here. I'll put the, I'll put the link in our chat. Back in 2017, um, she joined me for this really interesting call about what they were up to. And I, I was like, oh, this is very cool. 
Um, now my and that was around the, the same time that Tom Atley was talking a lot with Audrey. They had, I think, nine hours or more of conversations, probably more actually, and a lot of, of exchanges. And I was copied in some of those. And he wrote a, a kind of epic series of blog posts, like five parts on V Taiwan and everything, mm. kind of going deep. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, so uh, there we go. My brain just came back. Um, blog post, Charles. Yeah, I can find those. Sure. Thank you. Um, hey, Jerry, real quick. I just noticed yeah. that the, the invite that it looks like you sent out um, contains the old link without a password. Oh, I picked up it's from. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's a problem. Uh, can we send a repeat to the list? Yeah. Uh, so the, the one that we're in, you just copied to me, right? Yep. Okay. Let me do that then. <clears throat> uh, and Kenneth is sending a note saying, can't get into the meeting password. So uh, let me just post it to the, to the list. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Group. Uh, I think that's right. Send. Okay, just sent a note to the list. That would explain why Angel can't get in, etc. Okay, so I have a couple emails here from people who are not able to get in. That's good. That yeah. explains what's going on. No worries. <clears throat> Shoot. Thank you for catching that. I was yeah, no, no confused problem. about what was happening. All right. Um, and why don't we go around and check in a little bit um, just to catch up with where we are. Excellent. Oh, good, Edward. Awesome, thank you. Sorry for the misleading uh, link. Hmm. There we go. Angel, Kenneth should join. Hi. Jean, excellent. George, fabulous. Hi. Sorry for the screw up, everybody. My fault for sending the wrong link out to get into the room. I was treating it like an ARG. An ARG, like and, an alternate and, reality game? Yes, trying to find where the password could possibly be in all our correspondence. Excellent. You know, it was hidden in cues in my message. If you could, if you could decipher the palindrome and then slay the dragon, you would find your way here. But the much easier way was for, for Hank to say, hey, you sent the wrong link, and for me to copy the right link into an email. Buenas tardes. A Buenas todo el tardes. Mundo. ¿Qué tal en España? Fine, fine. It's too too hot here. Really? Uh, Midsummer has hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to be here with all of you. Buenos días para todos vosotros. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah. Do you want, Lauren? Do you want to check in? Oh. Hi, I just, uh, I'm super happy to be here. Um, and my kids are uh, not in school. They're at a little day camp, so I don't have to go pick them up during our call. Usually it's kind of uh, difficult for me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be able to just sit here and uh, enjoy the grown ups. Sweet, and we get your full attention, which we love. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm partners with uh, Charles, who's also here, Charles Blast, and we uh, run something called Kikolev, which is uh, working collective intelligence. And we're all about collective intelligence. So, um, so a part of the goal of today's call is to sort out what are our early projects and how do we form up into sub-conversations that can take on some of these, uh, some of these kinds of questions. Angel, do you want to just check in since you were just uh, reporting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, this is Angel Gonzalez. Uh, I'm based in, in Madrid, Spain, and uh, I'm running a social media marketing company that I set up back in 2009. I'm, as well as you, all you, in an infinite learning uh, operating system mode. And uh, I met uh, Jerry two months ago at uh, Exo World. I got really hooked with uh, his thoughts and uh, uh, we catch up later on. And uh, I'm in this uh, working group 
and very very excited to 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 be here and I apologize because the last two sessions I couldn't attend but anyway I have gone through the last session through the YouTube link and uh, really really interesting and I have some thoughts on that awesome awesome fabulous thank you Hamilton do you want to check in sure we're checking Thanks. out Polis I got sucked into the Polis website so so sorry excellent um, oh, that's good. Hi from Boston, hot, balmy Boston. Um, no, and that's it. I'm uh, uh, working. I'm excited this week to talk with Peter Van tomorrow. Maybe this will be a segue to Peter and I can step on everything he was going to say. Um, we finally actually got reinvited back into Cybos to InnoTribe to do a crazy webinar, one of a kind, never seen before, pirate TV experience for InnoTribe. So, uh, so I'm excited that we're building something. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be cool and working with some cool people and, and, and hopefully you guys will be able to see it um, and we will let you know. That sounds awesome. And I, I spoke at this Mystical Cybos conference for Peter in 2010, I think, something like that. Uh, that sounds right, in Toronto, I think. Um, so it's a financial services conference and, and Peter is the provocateur. He is the uh, agent of disruption for the, for the industry in some senses. Uh, do you want to check in since it seems like a natural segue? <laughs> I have so, so, so many uh, nicknames for me. <laughs> Provo provocateur, why not? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing really fine. Not only the, the nice project that we are going to do with Ham. Um, I mean, uh, what is on my... So there are two things. There, I'm, I have launched my virtual art exhibition, uh, the 1st of July. Uh, I can send you guys a link so you can walk around. You, you want me to put it in or are you going to put it in, Ham? Yeah, so that's a, normally it was a, a in-person uh, exhibition, but for COVID we couldn't do that. So I created an uh, online one. And there is also an augmented reality part that with your iPhone, you can select a, a painting and see whether it works in your living room, something like that. And then on the 15th, I will release the, what I call the vernissage video. Uh, and so just before this call, I was editing that video um, up since 5 a.m. this morning because I just was awake. Yeah. And so I could work in the silence of the home, nicely editing away. And then the other thing that may be interesting for this group from a content point of view, I virtually bumped into a good old friend of mine. I think you know him, uh, Jerry. Uh, um, uh, uh, Sounds like. A guy from Copenhagen. Uh, uh, Thomas Magden Migdal. No, no, no. no, no, um, no. He did better, better ventures or better works and those things. I can say it a hundred times. I saw him yesterday on, on my, anyway, I'll find it back. He, guy from Copenhagen. That's all we need to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a guy in Copenhagen. Yeah. And ho he's has uh, a startup that just came, comes out of uh, stealth mode. It's called everyvoice.io. Everyvoice.io. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing, they basically, have interviews with people and they listen to the audio to our previous conversation of text only or not only. So they listen to audio of people and they can uh, reveal the hidden stories of organizations or institutions. And they have a nice interface on top of that that is showing what are the themes that are being discussed and what are the emotions that are in the group. So much better from an HR perspective than the annual survey or the 360 degree views where people don't say everything that they, that they care about. I thought it interesting. I don't know how far they are. Um, but oh, it's Steve Jennings. Yes, Steve Jennings, yeah. Okay, I'm just looking at their website. And I met Steve, I, he was in Nomo mm -hmm. uh, with his family, okay. He's cool. now in Antwerp. <clears throat> ah, he lives in Antwerp. I think he was in Singapore. At Inno yeah, yeah, he was also at <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Mystery solved. Um, thank, thank you, Peter. Um, Hank, do you want to check in? 
Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, you know, I briefly kind of said to uh, Jerry and Peter earlier at the start of this call, I've been think, you know, for the past couple of days, really thinking about uh, part of the conversation that we talked about earlier, um, given that we're now moving into kind of this more buckets conversation, right? One of the early questions that we discussed was what is the difference between the think space and the dream space? And, um, you know, what is the role of the artist uh, in this whole mix? And um, that's something that I've kind of started putting some, some um, mental calories towards. So uh, my ideas aren't really quite articulated um, fully, but they're getting there. And that's, that's really kind of where my, my head's been at specifically in, in reference to this project. So that's my check-in. Love it. Um, Edward, you check in a little bit in the chat. Do you want to just check in uh, live? Yeah, I was just trying to be able to get uh, my, my boss, uh, my kitten from purring directly into the microphone here. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, my name is Edward Gordon. I've known Jerry. I think I've known you in that we've been in contact for something like four years, but yeah, I yeah. think we've known each other for about six or seven. Uh, when I'm not getting paid, I work with Job Hackers. We're a nonprofit giving away more than a million dollars in free training too. I think we've done it for about, we have about 500, 600 students so far over the last three years that we've been incorporated in free training uh, by providing a free six week class in agile software development, soft agile development methodologies, uh, which includes hard skill training because it preps students for the professional Scrum Master One certification. And our next class is August 4th. Welcome to see more at uh, www.thejobpackage.org. Um, and I have an interest in all this because I knew Jerry through Rex. And are you seeing a blip uh, rise in people interested because of lockdown and of basically the chaos? Yeah, the isolation the economy, market? the isolation economy is really interesting in this. Um, I was working with Larry um, over the last two years to be able to move them from uh, a primarily co-located classroom to, um, I mean, currently we're entirely remote. And we saw an increase for, in our remote classroom size from 20 to 30 to with uh, the work I did. We have 170 starting, but it, it's a free class, but it's from 7.30 to nine in the mornings on Tuesday and Thursday mm -hmm. um, for six weeks. And so you see about a 40 to 60% attrition rate. But even then that's pretty impressive that we've been seeing mm -hmm. uh, just more people coming in on the first time. Cool, cool, really interesting. Um, Ken, do you want to check in? This is early on the left coast and you are muted still. We don't hear you if you are checking in. Uh, Gene said he's on a different call, so I'm not going to ping Gene. Um, Ken may have stepped away. George? Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, from Romania. Buenos dias. Um, yeah, well, I th I'm I'm the the youngest guy from from all of you, and <laughs> my English is not so good. I will try to to explain it as well as I can. Uh, well, for now, I'm just gonna stay on the conversation and, and listen, and maybe creating um, ideas. So I hope you don't mind. I'm not gonna participate to to your conversation about ideas for now. You can jump in whenever and however you feel like. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for really, for that. Really appreciate it, uh, Matt. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, one is I've been uh, attempting to um, turn some of these concepts into a service layer and um, find us a project with one of my large clients. Uh, that conversation is. Um, is progressing to the next step where we're now at the CFO level. So I feel pretty good that um, we're, we're getting somewhere. And at some point I'd love to engage, you know, this community in um, actually thinking about the work itself, but we're trying to bring, we're trying to bring sort of this notion. Um, and actually, if I could just quickly screen share, I'm sorry. Um, cool. if I, um, but um, this, um, can everyone see that? Yep. Um, yeah. We're trying to we're trying to say that um, you know the way that most organizations work today is they analyze things they bring it into some sort of um, structured container they make decisions and then they they go ahead and they execute um, 
And this works in a pretty stable uh, environment, but we're not living in a stable environment. Um, and so we're, we're proposing, and this is sort of the, the idea, is that we start moving to a place where we're sensing in a much broader and holistic way, layering on multiple frames um, where you make sense of that. And then that stuff starts to filter out into the change making process. And this is, um, this was my response to Hamilton's challenge to me to how do you model what is um, OGM and um, I'd love to get reactions and thoughts, but this is kind of what we're trying to sell into um, into this corporate environment uh, to see if we can fundamentally change the way that they um, that they think and decide and um, act um, as an organization. So that's what I've been working on. Cool, thank you. And let's um, let's get Peter to Peter Van to check in and uh, then head toward, maybe we can get some feedback on your, your animation illustration right after I think that. Peter, didn't we hear from Peter? We got Peter, remember I skipped your order, Jerry. I mean, oh, that's right. Sorry. Uh, never mind. Um, that's right. Uh, and did we miss anybody? Uh, Gene is probably still on the call. Ken, good, you're back. All right, uh, for some reason my internet dropped out there. Um, ah. Hello everybody, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. Um, Checking in, you know, I got to say that for the first time since the lockdown began, I feel a little bit oppressed. Uh, I've noticed a shift in my mood where it's just starting to wear on me. And um, I've become very concerned about the mood I'm seeing out there. Of, uh, I think it's wearing on everybody and there seems to be a much more heightened, um, a, a, a much lower threshold for getting in arguments. And I'm seeing some really horrible things on social media and in the news and um Normally I'm pretty upbeat, but I'm feeling just a little bit out of sorts today. So um, I might be a little quieter than usual. And you might be, you have a very good sort of radar or detection system for these things. You might be picking up world world irritation in some sense where, where I, I agree. I think that, that everybody's um, impatient now with lockdown and, and in many cases uh, really under distress from the prospects from what's happened, you know, uh, uh, April was telling me yesterday that uh, one of the major airlines uh, is dropping 30,000 or 60,000 employees uh, unless travel picks up. And it's like, that's, you know, 40% of their workforce. Um, and that's, that's airlines, right? They, and that's not travel and tourism. And uh, it's just a whole bunch of, of very, very, very hard hit um, industries and sub industries. So as, uh, and, and I think one of the interesting questions as we head into a discussion about how do we organize ourselves is what sort of things might we do that would be useful um, to people in those situations, to communities in those situations. Um, so thank you for bringing that into the conversation. My pleasure. Um, Matt, do you wanna screen share again? And, um, and let's just see if anybody has any thoughts about the, illust uh, the illustration. Yeah, absolutely. Did everyone did everyone get a chance to go? I just want to make sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Has everybody yeah. checked in? I think so. Um, yeah, I will come back to this, um, and I'll go back one. Um, so it just to and, and it goes pretty fast here, but just this whole thing of um, you know we analyze in a world. It's really it's sort of this methodical process of dissecting and processing. Um, there are all these different decision making models that you have where you list out a bunch of different alternatives and then you choose the best alternative and then you go ahead and you you execute um, you know, those things and and um, into into a world where you need to actually not have just a single frame of viewing right this kind of goes and I'm starting in the middle that sense making has to have multiple different lenses and frames um, maps, if you will. Um, and that those things have to be um, used to draw in a broader sense of um, information. And I know, um, Jerry, your comment around that the information isn't sort of a, of a, a simple stream like here. It's really just like this, you know, maybe it was more random pieces, but then that starts to radiate out um, ideas and aligned perspectives that actually produce the kind of change that you, that you want to make. Um, and open global mind is about, for me, is about transforming kind of the known world and the way that we are today, what is into, um, into what might be. Um, and so, um, 
it's not perfect for our work, but I think this is a way of expressing it into this corporate environment saying, here's what we're trying to build for you, a whole new way of running your business, right? One that is much more sensitive um, and maybe less, um, less um, uh, explicit in its analysis, in its decision making, but it, it's it's more organic and um, and um, and Peter, I'm going to part of the thing that I was reading that it was the whole Benai stuff and this idea of this is more about kayaking than it is you know you know kind of kayaking through the whitewater rapids than it is about sort of this logical linear you know we take stuff in we make decisions and then we and then we execute on those things because we know our plans and we know our our answers and all it is is about you know, organizing people to get it done. So what are people's thoughts and reactions? So Ken made a comment in the, in the chat. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I love, uh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, go ahead on Ken. Okay, well, I, I, I love uh, how uh, you are visualizing what is the current scenario we are involved in and we have to deal with right now because uh, the world before uh, the pandemic was quite still. And you are uh, highlighting the stress we all are suffering. Uh, I learned the term uh, VUCA two years ago, vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, but that term is even more highlighted nowadays. So I think this is a very nice way to, 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 to set the uh, existing environment. Thank you. So Jerry, my, um, my comment, as I look at this, um, it seems to me that putting what might be after um, uh, change making kind of mirrors part of our problem. We tend to just do things first and figure out what it is. So I think there might be a, uh, it just, just this is my personal opinion. I'm totally open to um, two other views here, but I think we need to sense in and feel into what might be before we start the process of change making. So that's why I put the, that they should swap places. I think, I, you know what, I really like that. And I guess the, the piece that's not expressed here well is that there is this, there is this, like I almost see there's this line between what is and what might be. And if you imagine that that line is actually the arc of, of humanity, all things, that what is is on one side and what might be is on the other, but you're right. The way that it looks here is change making happens and then you get to what might be. It really is the, the, the sense making happens at the boundary of what is and what might be, right? Um, is that what you're saying? Or is the what might be even part of the sensing process? In, in my world, what might be comes from, you know, first establishing a shared understanding and exploring what are possibilities here. And, and if we allow ourselves to enter into an imaginative phase where we suspend the laws of physics and we have unlimited budget, we can generate a ton of really interesting ideas and then choose from among them the things that we think are actually gonna work given our constraints and then begin the process of how do we actually make that happen. I so, love it. And there might also be a difference between what might be and what becomes. Yes. Meaning, meaning what might be is imaginal. It's, uh, it's about, you know, what do we think is possible? <clears throat> what world do we want to create? How do we want to shape events, if that's even possible? And there's this whole conversation about, uh, and I, 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 in the chat I mentioned the Kinevin framework, uh, Dave yeah. Snowden's Kinevin framework, where he says in, in a complex environment you have to, you can't hire experts to tell you what to do and then go execute on that and expect those things to work out. You have to, in fact, experiment, sense, respond, et cetera. Uh, but it, it could be that, that, that your end state here isn't yet an end state. It's, it's like, you know, what is and what, what, will be, what will be or what becomes, and that what might be is an important imagining stage in between. Uh, it, it lives, I think you're right. I think it lives on that boundary, yeah. the boundary of, of, of what is and what becomes. I think that, I think that that's, I, I, like, I like that, guys. Also because sense making as I'm thinking about it, involves a kind of modeling of how you wish things would be or why you think things got to where they are, right? <clears throat> so it's like, so in some sense, sense making involves questions like, how did we get here? Why did this happen? Why would this person have done this terrible, stupid thing that got us into this situation? Those, those, those sorts of things are, are things we ask ourselves as we try to make sense. And then on the, as we look 
toward the future. So, so that's trying to make sense of how on earth did we get here from the past? As we look toward the future, what might be is one of the big questions. And it's one of the big questions we don't ask ourselves enough. Usually we're asking ourselves, how do I control this, this crazy unruly past in order to channel it towards something that'll be useful toward me and my people? whether that's a company and its employees and its shareholders, unfortunately, or whether it's you know, uh, you're a community that's trying to get something done. Um, so it's a, there's this aspect of imagination in there. I'm 100% there. And I think, you know, as I've been thinking about the sense-making process, I've been thinking that there's, that there's sort of three core skills. One is imagination, right? I think that's there and that's the connects to Hank's idea of the dream space and the artist's mind and, and those sorts of things. One is contemplation, which is sort of the kind of the deep thought and the deep processing of things. And then the, and the third is um, meditation, right? Which is the ability to sort of sit with yourself in the context of the changes that are, are happening around you and in the world that is there in your own relationship um, you know, to that. And so I think this idea of what might be is really you're, you guys are spot on. So good change. Any other, any other thoughts there? Because I think this is great and I'm gonna use all of this in my, um, in my conversation with my client. Well, I mean, Matt, I, I love this model. Um, you know, and I think um, I just keep coming back to it with all models, the, you know, I, and Jerry, you know who said this, I always forget it, right? You always correct me. So, George, but, George Box. You even know what I was gonna say before I said it, right? That all, all right. no model is perfect, but some are useful, right? Yeah. That, you know, Ken, your model of sense making is, is another layer on top of this, that there is no perfect model and that, Matt, for your models, for me, spark all these little micro models or macro models. And I just think it's so, I think it's great. I think it's like, it's, it's how progress is made. I love it. So I love your model. And I think, you know, for me, maybe I'll just say like one little layer I have is I clicked in for a client between sense making and change making because they're in their context, they needed an extra node of, and this is a term Jerry helped me get to, of choice making, right? So there's a sensing and then there's a changing, but there's also this, this filtering process. And we talked about, well, isn't that really what part of sense making is? It can be, right? So both are right. I guess it just depends on the lens or the frame, right? So I just think, I don't know, I think that model is a really interesting jumping off point. It tells a really nice story. I think it's really clear. I like the evolution from old to new. Well, can we can we stay can we stay here for just a second i know we're um i'd love to you know one of the things that i've been thinking about change is um as you look at cultures it's what we believe cha transforms into how we behave and how we behave transforms into our you know transforms into the, our the way that we act upon the world around us right and so there's one there's one theory that says okay, you go through a process, you make sense of it, and then you make a choice, and then you move that through. I think sort of the sense-making process, and sense-making is about creating meaning out of the information that you're getting, right? And by changing the mean, what things mean to you, you start to rewire those, those internal scripts. And once you do that, the natural byproduct of that if you can get everybody collectively making sense of the world and creating meaning in the same way is that they they naturally have actions and those actions then then move into you know move into the world and i think this idea that we are so smart we can make the right choice i think is what sometimes what gets in the way of us being successful versus we become you know, we adopt new meaning and therefore we act upon the world and the world itself then becomes, you know, starts to change. And I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of interested in exploring that, you know, that, that boundary. And I don't know, I know we're getting off track a little, Jerry, from the buckets, but this is one of the buckets that I would love to have is sort of this conceptual modeling, philosophy, really understanding the language that we use, because I think that's how we're going to develop the meaning amongst mm -hmm. ourselves it makes sense of what this OGM thing is. So, um, um, Laura, Lauren, then Hank. I just want to say that with the graphic, I'd like another graphic on a page after this with what, what are the things involved in say sense making or change making. So it's just clear, like just a whole long list of those actions. And so, and I also think that we could have, um, more than one model, like we could make up 
models for, say, for example, uh, it's a disaster situation and it's chaos. Mm. Maybe there, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's always the same process. I don't know, but maybe there's a different pattern for chaos than there is for when some people are stuck and they can't, they have no creativity. Mm. So, I don't know. In an earlier conversation with Matt and crew, um, where my mind went for the next slide kind of after, after this one was zooming in on the part between sensing and sense making and, and, and elaborating that and then zooming in on the part between sense making and change making and elaborating that. And I don't know if that, that helps if that's in the same direction of what you're thinking, Lauren, or if it's different. But that, but that would then unpack some of those issues. And then as we're sitting here having this conversation, I'm realizing uh, one of the big important questions is who gets to make sense for the organization? And typically we assign a bunch of people, we hire PhDs, we, we, we sort of dedicate that task to people. <clears throat> and a big piece I think of what we're talking about is um, changing it so that the organization becomes a sense-making instrument, a super organism, animal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but getting away from the idea that there's like the sense-making team over here, which used to be called the corporate strategy department that melted in the 90s. Like most, most advanced technology departments went away, most corporate strategy departments went away, this, and then this task got orphaned, right? And, and, and partly what we're saying is we need to do a little CPR on the task of looking at the world and figuring out how to act in it, I, th I think in its simplest way. And, and then I'll add a, another tiny thing, which is, and there's a, there's a meta conversation behind this conversation, which is, what degree of simplicity is needed for a model to talk to people in a corporate executive environment? Because the world is messy as hell and there are some really lovely deep models about change making like Kinevin, like a bunch of others. Um, I have a, a thought in my brain I can share called useful frameworks and models, which has you know tons of these. And, and so, exactly. And so then how do we simplify enough that this makes sense and that this moves an organization into a new way of being and doing stuff? Uh, Hank, then back to Lauren. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, Matt, I was just going to ask you to kind of clarify one thing. You made a comment in there about, like, us us um, thinking that we're smart enough to to figure it out. And, like, do you mean that that's the rock that we trip over or that's something that we don't believe and therefore it gets in our way? Uh, where I was going is that this idea that we – we take everything in and then we make our decision and then, and then we move forward into execution right. is, is a kind of a failure of this idea that this is a dynamic response situation. Right. Right. And so to choose and to, and then to move forward, I think is, is almost a fallacy in a world that is, you know, VUCA or, or Benai, right? You have right. to actually be constantly reacting and adapting. And I think, you know, Jerry, to your point about who does this, I think it's everyone, right? The answer is the more diversity that you have in this system and the more of those points of views that you, you draw in, you know, the more capable you are going to be of being able to make sense of things, right? Mm -hmm. That sense making is a, is a team sport, not, a, not an individual sport. And I think it also requires um, the latest technologies, right? I think, uh, for us thinking about how artificial intelligence combines with human intelligence in this type of, uh, in this type of world, I think it's going to be really important to our, our success. Um, because our problems are so big, you know, the things that we're trying to solve, they're only getting exponentially larger, right? Um, you know, the climate change issue as more people get involved and, you know, as we grow our population, like these things are just, you know, huge and I mean it's hard enough to change a 40,000 person organization let alone um, you know eight nine billion people right and I think this is this is our challenge that's that I think is um, urgent right now and and I think we're in a wicked problem world there have always been wicked problems afoot but right now we're really facing them yeah and you know Horst Riddle is the guy who coined the term wicked problems there's other people who have other framings for it uh, VUCA and BANI are ways of elaborating on what is wicked about them or what are the aspects of wicked, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of, you know, Charles has just put his, his finger on it entirely. It's really, really wicked. <laughs> Sorry, I love that. Um, 
any other any other thoughts from anyone? Uh, Lauren, did you want to add back to that conversation? Yeah. So when I'm looking at these different models, um, it seems like there's already a lot developed. But uh, what I think would be amazing is to really um, have a process of even uh, figuring out which model could fit which situation and how you assess like the problem and the people involved and then kind of match what's going on to one of these frameworks that has already kind of been developed and using kind of like patterns pattern language to to do that and work out more systematic way of uh, defining the roles needed to do those things and um, below that the um, so kind of like the archetypes and then the roles and then below that on the tertiary level like specific roles using specific tools um, so you can get a really more organized kind of like um, uh, matching going on that's what just kind of speaks to me because look at all those frameworks that you showed like there's already so much work being done you know and I wonder we have to reinvent the wheel <laughs> well, and Lauren you know this idea of like this people choose frameworks right I you know we work with an organization they say okay we want to use you know a quarter strategy model or we want to use this we want to use that right and and that whole notion of that interior spinning is that those are we actually it's not about choosing any one, it's about using all of them. You know, almost like how do we get to a place of simultaneousness of, of the latest, uh, of all of the latest ways that human beings think about problems, you know, to make sense of the world. And that's why I think you actually need multiple applications from multiple different vantage points in, in, in combination with each other, because I don't, I don't think this idea of whose model is right is the, the answer or which model is right in the situation is the answer. It's how are we using all of the ways that we have learned to think and see the world simultaneously so that we can learn and so we can, so we can actually handle the complexity that's, that's facing us right now. So I think you're right. And I think it's, I think it's also, we have to get, we have to get far more, capable of allowing all of it to come in into the frame simultaneously. Um, Ken, do you want to say a little more about Chris Corrigan? I'll, I'm going to share my brain about him in a second because I have heard of him. But uh, do you want to talk about how the uh, link you just posted um, fits? Chris is a, an open space facilitator. He does a lot of work in the nonprofit world and has a wonderful blog. I put a link to one of his uh, posts here. And I was just reading this yesterday about uh, collective sense making, and he suggests, you know, this, uh, what he's drawing on here is, you know, we're looking at a COVID world now. And so he's, these are coming from particip participatory narrative inquiry and human systems dynamics to first observe the situation, watch for a little bit. And I love that he says, you know, have people bring in notes about the situation. So ask everybody who's going to be there uh, to bring in at least 10 data objects, like, you know, stories, fine-grained tweets, news items, reports, anything, um, and then have them share that and look for patterns and, you know, put them on post-its and start to cluster them together and then say, okay, you know, what's, what's actually going on here? What are we noticing in general? I love these questions. In general, I notice this. In general, I notice this, but contradictions. On the other hand, I notice this, but there's also this. And then I'm really surprised about this and I wonder about that. So these, mm. these uh, questions I find really useful in groups to tease out and help to um, create a, a space where people can let go of their, I have the right perspective and really sit with, that's interesting. You know, I hadn't considered it from that perspective before. And then moving through a process to kind of shake that out into a space where we can say, now we have a sense of what this means. How are we gonna use it to further our aims? And so I just switched in my brain to the current state of the coronavirus pandemic because I think that we are enacting in real time the thing we're talking about, which is one of the buckets we need to frame up in how to organize OGM. So, so 
this is the place where I, and, and this, the brain that I'm using, the tool that I'm using is not very collaborative and it's just me, but this is where I put what I'm sensing right now about this situation. So, uh, you know, a vaccine is kind of a long shot. A few countries reacted well. U.S. recklessness is turning into a major spike. Uh, we are actually in the middle of five crises, which came from Anand Giridharadas, had a really nice uh, set of, uh, he, he had a really nice video. If anybody knows Anand, he's really worth listening to. Anyway, this mode of synthesizing is what I'd love for us to be able to do together, right? In whatever tools we prefer, using whatever models make sense for the situation. And the more we can increase our model literacy, the more we can increase the reliability of the data that we're using and sharing, and the more that we can use these in a way that doesn't just confuse the hell out of everybody in sensible, important conversations, the closer we get to something good that is a form of collaborative sense making. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and in the middle of that, we need to take pauses. We need to step outside and sit in the grass. We need to talk to each other over a glass of wine. We need to like, like all these other things that will allow us to soak in what was said, where we are, what's happening, because it's really easy to get into overwhelm. It's really easy to get depressed by the variety of things going on. Um, but the good news is that it costs nothing these days to hear from the world's experts, to synthesize, to share information, to put the, like, like the cost of communicating, the cost of authoring is your time mostly, the tools are cheap, uh, et cetera. So, so yeah, how do we do that? And what, and what do we call, is this the sense making guild? Is this, I mean, is, is that what this is? And, and that sounds great. I love it. And I want to hear more about the guild stuff. Other, other, anybody with, with thoughts about this? So what I'm hearing, Jerry, just to be able to get a sense of it from what I'm looking at is that there is an overall goal towards giving everyone the opportunity here to be able to contribute to uh, a, as uh, sensing organisms uh, to be able to bring in their individual points to be able to bring towards a larger theme um, much like how when you showed COVID you showed all of your uh, even in independent observations and the pieces that you brought together with the brain so that I can better understand is there a theme other than sense making about sense making that we would as individuals be able to bring and are we sending all of those individual points to you directly or are we sending them to the website are we sending them to a portal well um so good question edward um so first um there's a, several layers to what you're asking <clears throat> one is as we look to an organization that might be wanting to use ogm as a platform and as a set of services and so forth who is busy making sense of things. And I think that what I said earlier is, has political implications. I mean, I believe strongly in workplace democracy. I believe in trusting your employees. <clears throat> and what that means is allowing many, many people, whoever is gifted or inspired to do so, to be modeling, suggesting, uh, build, you know, shaping the narratives that occupy the rest of us. And then everybody doesn't have to do this because everybody's got lots of jobs to do and, you know, uh, but, but the more we can share out the narrative, the more uh, Joe Bob can say, I like Sally's narrative on X and include it into his explanation of why we should do something some way. <clears throat> your, your, your discussions become much more rich and robust as you move through reality, trying to make changes in, in the model that Matt showed earlier. But then practically, as we're doing our work here, um, part of the reason why I said, why there's a LinkedIn group for OGM, why there's a mailing list for OGM, why there's a medium channel for OGM, and why OGM is trying to build out something patched together from open source and other kinds of tools that exist today, and then improve them, is that I don't certainly want to be the bottleneck for all these ideas. I want us to find our way to the tools that we like to express with. Maybe it's shooting YouTube screencast videos. Maybe it's uh, creating animations uh, like Nikki Case does. I don't know. <clears throat> but... Um, and then sharing them broadly with the world so that we improve the conversation in ways that all of us can catch and see, which generally means use a hashtag or post it back someplace more central for us so that we can see it. But I'm really interested in, in like right now we're having kind of an inside conversation because I'm going to post this video on YouTube, but eight people are going to watch it. We're just talking to ourselves right here. 
But if we were to, to synthesize some of what we did here and post it on LinkedIn or on Medium, and then if each of us were to say, hey, tweet, tweet, retweet, you know, amplify broadcast, then a couple thousand people would be in the conversation <clears throat> and we would be in conversation with the dozens and dozens and dozens of people that each of us already follows today, right? Um, as Ken just showed us. Uh, you know, here's a person who has, here's Chris Corrigan who has interesting thoughts. And I had, you know, I had obviously <clears throat> followed uh, Chris for a while and had a bunch of his posts already in my brain, each of which are connected into what those topics were about. So that's, that's kind of modeling what's going on. Matt. Um, maybe I want to step back because Edward, I think, I think you asked a really interesting question. And then Jerry, you went to some very kind of tangible artifacts in in your response to that question and maybe i'll go to the imagination space here the dream space for just a second which is um i i as an as an individual in this world each of you as individuals in this world are um constantly processing what's going on Everybody is right, and they're running through. They're running through this thing called, you know, our brain, and we have scripts, and we have models, and we have frameworks, and lenses, and all that kind of stuff. And when you know, and I'm looking at like how somebody mentioned something on this call, and the chat just like blows up, and then all of this, all of this other stuff, which comes from human knowledge that's been created, all of a sudden flows into this, and you know, to be able to click on all of these things and to learn all these things that it's, it's, it takes time and it's difficult, right? For me as a human being to, to even absorb that information. And I guess the, 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 the dream space part of me goes, what if there's a day where when I have a thought and I'm engaging in thought that you guys are all there in 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 my consciousness that the world is there in my consciousness that that people who have already made sense of certain things that i'm attempting to make sense of become transparent to me right and and then when i want to articulate those thoughts that there are there are vehicles for me to do that that are really really easy right and so 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 things are things that you need when you need them to make sense of the world in a more um, intelligent way or it, at the level that's required to comprehend what we're dealing with come into the frame when you need them, right? Um, and so I'm wondering how this conversation can be continuous without it being synchronous. Um, and awesome. that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing that I, I don't, I mean, I don't think we've invented it yet. I mean, and we, we can think about how we're participating in today's system, but I also think that there's like, um, I go back to this idea that so many people have thought things before I have that I don't have access to and I will never find because the minute I go to the Google machine, I get 27 ads from consultants who want to sell me their services or 27 ads from you know the, the AI machine trying to affect the way that I, you know, the, for me to consume or buy stuff, or you know, and I'm not trying to go there, but we have, we have, we have, we have snipped ourselves from the continuation of human knowledge, and therefore we're not being able to apply it to our problems, and and our problems are only getting bigger. So that's the that's the dream for me, and I don't know what that looks like. Um, Matt, I love that. And I think you know that I wrote a series of things called SNP about the financial system. So exactly that. Um, Charles. Hi, thank you. Um, knowledge gardening comes to mind and sort of uh, collective bookmarking and uh, Digo hypothesis and stuff. That's something we, we can do now. We just have to sort of agree on one or more places and ways to do that. Um, Another term or uh, concept that comes to mind is the PLN or personal learning network or personal learning environment, PLE, different names for sort of what are our own personal sweet spot combination toolkit. Um, and I think within 30 seconds um, or some of us a little more or less, um, we could go around and actually quickly take a, 
uh, kind of survey or, you know, understand who's really using what, who loves what, for what reasons, and, and um, you know, each of us has a special combination that works and we know and it's fluid enough, hopefully, and so forth. And I think there we can already start to, to get more interoperable. And it's also my goal to set up a call, uh, a Zoom session uh, separate from our regular Thursday calls to contrast a series of tools around a single topic. Uh, and Gene and I have been collaborating on that, but I'm not, I, I need to sort of ramp that up so that we actually sort of book the call and, and go do that. Um, we can also, it would be also nice to sort of share our tool suites or preferences in some more persistent way, uh, you know, and use our tools and figure out what that looks like. So we also have a fledgling website where we could put membership pages. Uh, we may want to use something like Notion or Coda uh, or Roam uh, because these are tools that are kind of in the waters. And there are people I'm going to invite in now into the conversation who are doing Roam-like <clears throat> tools themselves who, who own, you know, their own, their own platforms and stuff like that. Uh, Lauren? Um, so I was just thinking, say, for example, if uh, among us and between us, we could bring 2,000 people into the conversation through Twitter, or Facebook, whatever. And I was also thinking, uh, with my experience with other groups, leads me to want to quickly bring this into practice instead of theory, because I think that it will um, just for, it will be faster in terms of our development and actually like finding the tools to meet what we're trying to do. And I think that um, one thing that could be super fun is to uh, kind of attack really relevant social issues like race. Like I just heard this woman talking about white fragility and how um, it's like impossible to have a race conversation with white people because we don't, we can't even deal with our whiteness. And so producing like crazy shit, like maybe um, like a guide for like how to avoid like a crappy conversation about race and like all the things that, you know, white people say that are like black people are like, oh God, like again, but like actually like producing, using these kind of like sense making things with this super interesting edgy topics that are actually interesting that produce helpful system level views of things like using all of our talents to really like produce like helpful stuff for these you know topics that are in the news and um you know stuff like that that you know because that's where our hearts are and to show that and to kind of that brings uh, we can more easily bring diverse voices into the conversation who normally wouldn't be included and um, show them our sense-making tool and also get kind of feedback on, so it could be fun that way. So Lauren, you're inspiring sure. me, you're inspiring me to, to, to suggest something. Uh, let me pass it to you in a second, Charles. Uh, you're inspiring me to suggest something inspired by yarn bombing, which is like, um, we could choose somebody who just said something really interesting and then four of us could say, I, oh, I, th this really has juice for me. And we could create different manifestations of what they said and then just go send it to them or post them and, and retweet around them and say, hey, we love what you said. We've tried to tell that story in different ways using different tools or something like that. And just repeat that as a, as a game for a, few, for a few sessions, like pick, pick a half dozen different blog posts or interesting juicy things and then riff on them uh, several of us not the same people but whoever jumps up and goes oh that sounds really cool and just go do that a couple times does that sound like fun for anybody can you, can you say specifically what that is like um, how it work? well like white fragility right <clears throat> if, if somebody has a post on white fragility something really interesting we could jump in and say you know uh, how about how about expressing it this way here's what i think it means here's where it comes from <clears throat> or it could be something about strategic planning, or it could be something else. Uh, but but different of us participating in OGM would riff on it in different ways. It's almost, it, well, it, it is, and it's almost like we build a network, and we have to build a network of 
people who are who are practicing sense making and 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 then what we do is we ping that network at any given time and we say here is something we need to make sense of and it could be it could be a problem one of us is dealing with it could be a topic it could be anything and then and then we produce o OGM studios here's how we're making sense of this thing right and i see smiles and i don't know if it's because of kevin mm -hmm. Um, and I want to go to Charles, but I want to say hi to Kevin and Judy who just joined the call. Um, I, I was I was going to offer something that was was going to be a lot more off the wall and out there, but then Jerry, you set me up very well with this term yarn bombing. Um, <clears throat> so Lauren, is this is this possibly the moment for the sock puppets? Oh, because sure, I mean, go maybe for not it. completely through all that that <laughs> idea, you know, with the different voices and stuff. But maybe so, Jerry. I mean, and everyone, like Lauren and I, we love to have fun, and we <clears throat> plan a lot of things that that don't all happen. But one of the things we talked about is making videos with sock puppets. So, Lauren, you could fill in more there if you like. <laughs> yeah, we think uh, we think sock puppets are really allow a lot of uh, expression and uh, we could all have sock puppets and then act things out and then just make like super quirky uh, videos um, kind of acting out what happens and um, it can like like actually puppetry is a really deep um, uh, and old methodology of social critique and um mm. you know uh mocking power and this came up i mean just to give it even more context and it kind of relates maybe ultimately or in, in some ways where we <coughs> might go as a gm um but we've been brewing since last year um a, a new kind of court for the internet <laughs> mm. And so the, the concept came out of a lot of discussions around um, powdered wigs and kind of really um, amping up the, the drama and the snark. And um, so, yeah, let's see. I think we, we could all have have some fun there. And there's something very playful about about that, which is which is nice. Uh, Kevin, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just I spoke a couple of years ago at the UN one with some finger puppets. Uh, it was Remy talking to Eleanor Ostrom, and uh, about the UN development program and stuff. It, it was well received by That's some awesome. and other people thought there was a critique, which there was. So anyway. Right. But it was provocative. It was, it was, it, it and it draws attention. Yeah. To it, it, yeah. It, it, <clears throat> it, it, there were voices that weren't in the room that only, only finger puppets I thought could, could uh, talk about. And there's there's a role for the court, the court jester uh, often had that leeway that that you know in the court the court jester could say things that nobody else was gonna utter <clears throat> and and it, you know they risked getting their head cut off because some of these things were actually like really strong critiques but but they had license <clears throat> and that's that's really interesting my my first boss in the world my first job in the world was at Mobile Oil Corporation before it was Exxon Mobil. And my boss was the youngest company commander in Vietnam. He was a short West Virginian who was still alive and kicking and having a great time. <clears throat> and he had license from the bosses. So whenever somebody would retire, he would, we would put on kind of a roast of the retiree and he would contact their spouse and get a whole bunch of pictures and then doctor them up by sending them down to the graphics department to do art on and then shoot again on the slides. <clears throat> anyway, um, stuff we would do today with like Snapchat and whatnot, right? But, but he was sort of the court jester in, in, in that department. And it was really interesting to watch him use that license. And so how might we be warmly provocative without being disruptive? Because there's a, there's a short line between jester and troll, <clears throat> right? And what does that look like? Well, I think, you know, and I think this is this idea of story threading is at that boundary layer of, of when you start to create meaning, how you express that meaning into the world so that it, it, it has change. And I think this, you know, I think this idea of sort of a branded puppet theater that is creating really interesting commentary on the commentary that's is sort of being propagated in the world is it's kind of a it's a fascinating idea. And I think this is where, as we start to think about how we structure this thing, um, there, again, I go back to that, that framework, which is 
how do we, where do we bring, how do we bring in a lot of information and where do we bring that? How do people access that information and that we all can process it and then, and then what do we turn it into and who's helping us turn it into what so that it actually has impact on the world so it changes, you know, what is into, you know, what will be, right, or what becomes. And I think we need, we need to kind of isolate these different areas and start to build the skills and, and tools and capabilities to do that. Because I think we, you know, if everybody moves to this point and everybody moves to this point, I think we're going to miss. I think we need to break it down again, going back to that idea of the buckets of work and say, where, where do we want to put energy and who wants to put energy where? Because if we're not drawing in all of this stuff, we don't have the raw material needed, right? And so that's one of the problems. But if we also don't have the, the interesting tools like the puppet theater and, and those things to be able to express what we're making sense of and, and to be able to communicate to a world that is quite honestly overwhelmed with, you know, the torrent of information, like we're gonna miss too. So I think, I, I think we have, a, you know, quite a bit of problems to solve and dividing and conquering is probably a good thing. Which is part of the goal of this call, and we've gotten mostly through the call, and I think we've identified one bucket, sort of, where 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 this conversation has kind of stayed. So uh, next next week, let's rin lather, rinse, repeat, and see if we can't uh, elaborate more different kinds of buckets, because I think there are a series of really interesting conversations to have to figure out how OGM becomes a thing and builds its builds itself out as we use it. Because I love the idea of you know uh, fire aim ready, <clears throat> actually. I own fireaim.com, I think, because long ago I coined the phrase uh, fire aim never quite ready, hmm. <clears throat> which means the idea that, you know, ready aim fire is the, is the usual sequence. We're never going to be ready. We need to go do something. You hope you don't hit anybody and you try not to, but then you have to correct and aiming is correcting. Aiming is, is sort of feedback in. Um, and I've, I've never done anything with the website and we could, and we could easily do that. But I th I, I'm getting the feeling maybe there's a, and, and making it a guild might make it too official, but in the chat I'm saying like, is there a jester guild or a coyote guild or a trickster guild that's part of OGM? And mm -hmm. anybody who feels like playing these games, <clears throat> whether it's sock puppet theater around, around really important issues using sophisticated models, for example. I mean, we could have sock puppets doing the narrative and we could have a brilliant Kumu systems map behind it. And I think the contrast is really, really interesting. Oh my right. God, I love it. We'll get a lot more <laughs> traffic, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly, yes. And, and if we riff on that with different tools and different approaches and different humor styles and even parodies of you know, people who are doing normal stuff in the world, because puppets can do lots of stuff, then and the trickster and the puppet are really lovely and evocative things to bring into this conversation. So Lauren, thank you. Charles, thank you. Um, uh, I think that, that it opens a bunch of doors to serious play that are important for what we're doing. Because if this turns into, uh, if the brain software were a database app that said, you know, now enter data into these six fields and you can create a new node in your, in your map, I would never have used it. The brain is playful and open to use for me in a way <clears throat> that allowed me to go invent my own cliches, my own riffs, and, and it, it, it sort of, just expressive enough that I was able to do things that humored me. <clears throat> Had it been, you know, 20 people in a corporation who'd been told to go fill out forms in a database, I would have been out of there. Like I would have been very hard to motivate to go do this unless the dynamics of the group were <clears throat> extraordinary. Yeah, deadly fun. I like that. <clears throat> serious play. Exactly. People, people, including kids, love serious fun. Serious fun is a great way to go. Uh, any other thoughts on this as we're, as we're on the subject? I, coyotes <clears throat> guilds have boundaries and coyotes pee on boundaries. I, I think that I Kevin, I, I think that's right. I think maybe the the, the idea of guilds and, and Dave Rutley on my team uh, joined here and one of the things that he um, introduced to one of the sessions is this idea of these different and Lauren, I think you use this as well, these ideas of archetypes, right? And how do we build out various archetypes? Um, you know, you, so you have the shaman archetype, you have, you know, you have the, um, the engineer archetype, you have the artist archetype, you have the coyote archetype, like, like, I think this idea of being able to move in and out of these archetypes, and maybe, Kevin, guild is the wrong 
it is the wrong word, um, but maybe we have to reinvent what, what that even means. But to be able to adopt these different archetypes and play in that space, um, because I think we need all of those minds working together, right? Um, yeah. You know, it's like Dylan says, to live outside the law, you must be honest, you know, it's another way to think about this. Yeah. Troops. Um, yeah. I, I'm also, I, like, I wonder, I'm, I want to ask you guys, how quickly do we try to tackle the technology platform problem, right? Um, you know, we've been debating, do we cobble together things um, and just use what's readily available and start behaving in this way? Or do we, you know, or do we have to actually be inventing, you know, be inventing these, this technology platform? And it like, when I think of really simple things like, um, um, you know, there's sometimes I'm thinking of a, of a problem. I'm like, boy, I want to phone a friend. It would be interesting if there was a 1-800 number and you call and you ask the question and all of a sudden, you know, the right person gets pinged to answer that question or the right knowledge object gets brought to, you know, you know, brought to you. And how do we make this knowledge really accessible and broad? But I mean, I think like, like simplicity is really, or even just a text message where you just write a text message saying, does anybody know any of this? And it kind of comes to you really instantaneous. Cause I think that's the part that's gonna make this thing interesting and successful is you can ask it anything and it, you get real answers, not so you, poor answers. <clears throat> you've just summarized uh, 30 years of, of critique of knowledge management where it was always mm -hmm. trying to fill out forms and databases <clears throat> so that somebody could do search against a big database of cases or something like that, maybe with a little AI. And what really works is, hey, you need to talk to Bob and Sally right now. <clears throat> and then some ability to whoosh like magic, generate that conversation. But then, and this is just my critique, but then wouldn't it be cool if Bob and Sally could hand you big chunks of their wisdom in some shorthand form, in some crystallized, you know, not a Tide Pod, <clears throat> but rather, you know, some, some interesting Indra's web pearl in the net that allow mm. you then to harness it, use it, and then ask a couple much more intelligent questions of them to implement their, their thinking better or represent it better or whatever, and then other people could riff on it and so forth. So part of the problem is we're finally getting to the point where it's like, hey, it'd be great if you talked with these three people, which is what knowledge management should always been about. But now you have to ingest what each of those three people are thinking and how they think and what, they're, what they've got. And that's hard because we don't have tools to share them with each other. And we are not busy trying to synthesize them with and for each other and, 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 <clears throat> right? So if we were all doing a bit more of that work, this gets easier. And I think the, the leverage in this is, is pretty immense. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that uh, there's a, an underlying current of every, what everybody's saying about talking to other people. So there's this issue of communication. And it, it's not like some database queries where you can just type in a string and then get back a whole bunch of stuff. Sometimes it takes a whole bunch of a whole bunch of talking to other people in order to determine what the actual content is and then proceed on from there. And th this is part of the reason it's, it's been so hard to encapsulate in the KM system is because it, it's actually not a give me this. It's this and this and this and this and this and this oh, that's what's going on. <clears throat> And, and there's hardly a cam system out there that lets you put in the nuances of what actually happened in the situation. And mostly what happens in this situation won't carry over into this one, but there's a bunch of insights from here that if you, if you heard them, you could change everybody's life over here. Judy, to you. Well, it was a combination of <clears throat> wanting to rip a little bit on the continuous learning dimension, because mm. that's what happens and is so energizing in these conversations. And then tying that back to the graphic aspect because I remember doing a paper once on the jester as the agent of truth in drama. And somehow if we could do virtual cartoons and just keep them moving and send those out in some fashion to the world, <clears throat> invite others to riff on the same, that could get pretty exciting. I, I think that the technology of actually executing the mind is non-trivial. I mean, you can do it, but it takes a lot of discipline. And so I've been struggling with how we actually engage people at the energy and quickness that we want in connecting the network <clears throat> with a lot of people. 
you said the continuous learning and I missed the last word. Oh, well, the notion of continuous learning in the network itself. Yeah. And whether you can actually do it with OGM itself as the technology platform or what other strings or threads we need to do that, which is what you've been talking about on the part of the call I missed, I'm sure. <clears throat> but if, if we can figure out a way to make that work, then I think we'd be ahead of the game because I'm a little nervous about how readily the world will embrace jumping into the mine. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I think this is maybe where the guilds do come into, into play, right? This idea of like, I, I think back to these days where you walked into the Citadel and you would ask a question of the person who sort of owned the library and they would be, they knew every book in that, in that room and they were able to, to sort of draw on it and, and sort of pull from that text. Now, you're going to need some, you're going to need some human intervention here as well of, and people who want, all they want to do is to be keepers of the knowledge. And, you know, and Jerry, I mean, I think you're one of these individuals where I know if I ever ask you anything, you can, because of your knowledge management, personal knowledge management, you can draw on so many things, right? Um, it's, um, but you also, Judith, to where you were going is you, we probably need people who are, who are literally just listening to these conversations and taking snippets and starting to assemble them and just, just capturing what's going on. Because I can capture and I can think, but I can't capture and think at the same time, right? Those, well, those things are really I difficult. Can't, and I can't capture, think, and write or type at the same time. So right. it's like I can engage verbally or I can engage in the chat, but if I get into the chat, then I'm not fully engaged in the dialogue. <clears throat> And so that dimensionality of communication is something that might be the subject of another conversation. Well, and, and, and I will say that we, at Collective Next, we build a lot of, we've built a lot of capability of the, the kind of these story threader people, right? Whether they're the graphic facilitation or whether they're the documenters or whether they, you know, are podcasters or those sorts of, you know, things. And I think that's something that we want to bring in here and just say, Take everything we're saying and create with it, right? And that's where, yeah, Sir Charles. No, no, I, I didn't, want, go ahead if you want to finish. No, 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 I, I, was, I was running out of steam and I saw your hand, so I want to hear what you uh, have to say. No, no, I, 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 it's, it, I hope this is not too much off track, but I think, um, with, I love all of that, by the way, and I'm totally with it. Um, and now I might have just lost my thought because I got excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was something about, oh, oh yeah, this is an observation, which I don't know if this is useful or not, but I just had this um, realization of a kind that in a particular um, uh, environment situation with a synchronous conversation, face-to-face, -face, as, as best we can these days, in, in all these wonderful Zoomy ways. Um, <clears throat> so Judith, what you were just describing um, basically highlights the, a kind of very, or, organic, um, hopefully flowing and hopefully like functional, um, uh, like phasing in and out of synchronous and asynchronous, <coughs> in a kind of literal way in terms of the attention on the flow of the thread that's actually being spoken. But then there's this other thread, there's these multiple, that's the dimensionality that I just got. I, I heard it in terms of mm -hmm. synchronous and asynchronous within each of us within the conversation. So I hope that's useful in some way. <laughs> I think it's very useful because this, this boundary in the old world of computer aided collaborative work or whatever these things were called, which you know, later got called groupware and now is social media plus, 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 there were these categories like synchronous and asynchronous were different things and you use different tools for them. When in fact, we need to be picking up the same conversation and elaborating on it. And, and one of the things I happen to like about the brain is that I can bring it in, I can drag it into a conversation like this. Unfortunately, I have to take over the screen. We don't all have multiple screens, so I, I can't be riffing on things on the side without interrupting a lot. So there's no nuance to it whatsoever, but I can add to a conversation or try to as we're moving. And then in between conversations, I'm every day all the time busy curating this thing. So that's one of the reasons I adore it is that it works in both modes. It's not, a, it's not an either or kind of tool, but how do we pick more tools that allow us to gracefully move things ahead without reinventing them all the time? Because one of the things that I don't like about 
almost all the other mind mapping tools is that when you run out of room on the virtual page, you have to <coughs> tear the page off and start a new mind map. And then you're never going to find that old mind map unless you're insanely disciplined. And I, I've met very few mind mappers who know where the 5,000 mind maps they've done all went uh. and how to, how to get to them. <laughs> and would Charles, Charles right. would, that, would that be describing you? Yeah, kind of. Okay, good. I mean, on different drives, it's not, it's not perfect, but... Is there a hyphen in anal retentive? Because I feel the same way. <laughs> They're labeled. They're um, labeled and dated mostly, so... Let's go to Kevin. Jerry, that's a, that's a fundamental problem with any kind of knowledge base is being able yes. to access what's the knowledge in there. Exactly. Exactly. Kevin. So as I look at this, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, obviously comic book uh, uh, analogies. And, you know, I'm thinking of Charles and the X-Men. And he knew when it was time to send in the Wolverine. It's a Wolverine problem. And when it's time to send in somebody who, who has a laser vision or whatever. And, and I think for this to work, you need some kind of switchboard that knows when it's time for Wolverine, when it's time for whatever. It's like what I'm looking at right now broadly is an interdependent local uh, economy uh, that works in a place across race and class. And so I have tons of energy for that. <clears throat> I'm both talking to experts, but have tons of time for naive newbies because nobody's figured this part out and there are some things that are working. And things that I was into regenerative agriculture a year or so ago, I'm not into. That's just, it's going to be slow. You got to move at the pace of hospital purchasing. So, I'm, I'm, and, and so, you know, if you want to ask me a question on that, I will give you a bunch of time and I will give a bunch of time to newbies and I have experts that I'm talking to. It's, it's kind of like my beat. You know, you got to figure out what everybody's beat is. If you imagine it's a city room of experts or whatever. And you know, for me right now, it's the interdependent, uh, you know, local economy. And I, the, I think to, to make this work, you, you, you got to ask me or other people the questions that, that we really want to know more about, that I know a lot about, but I want to know a lot more about. There's a, a, a conflict or a, a, a synergy opportunity in the difference between knowledge acquisition and organization and creativity that rips off the knowledge points. And mm. I don't, that, that could be an interesting subject for a future call because the generative energy of this group talking things through is very powerful because you have a lot of creative thoughts getting connected in different new ways that lead us in new directions. And that's a different dimension than my current understanding of the brain per se. So we're getting three dimensional and changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, Judith, I completely, I completely agree agree with you and um and it is the generative power of of minds coming together in the right and i'm i'm wondering if there isn't almost like there's like this there's this place that we're all capturing our knowledge and how do we capture knowledge in a way that we personally can access it but then we can also um you know, release the APIs to other people so that they can access that knowledge. But then there's also on top of it is almost like the conversation. And I'm wondering like, what would happen if we had, you know, Lord, to your point, 2000 people um, that are in our network and this channel is always open and people come and go. Like I'm noticing, you know, you, you showed up after Hamilton left and you know Kevin came in and some of us are still here and some people left but what if it was just open and people are coming in and coming out and and that's just part of the that's just part of the rhythm of you know the way that we we work and and Kevin the concerns that you have um you bring to this table and everyone just brings what they bring and the conversation either will go in a direction that's useful for you or not and then people are coming in it's almost like a an ongoing unconference, right? Um, 24 seven around the globe and, um, and we just invite more people in. As long as we keep our eye on the ball with the, with the documentation, the repository, the transcriptions and all, all that stuff, then that's all great. But let, let, let it flow, let it roll, fill up the drives, you know? <laughs> well, so well, that's yeah. a con conflict yeah. that I dealt with in strategic planning and other places, the conflict between ideation and execution, and how do you bridge that jump in terms of the next stage of movement by the group to doing something about something. And so I think, again, that's a rich topic for a lot more discussion and a lot of ideation. Lauren, you want to jump in? 
Yeah, so I I think that would be a great idea. I am I I just um oh, I really am excited about this idea of like a doing call and I want to host that where it's totally like jump in chaos random people and let's make sense in like crazy shit like a, an issue that's super interesting and just like um inviting kind of uh, sense makers and uh, random people who are affected by the situation to come together and just like use all these tools to try to figure stuff out. But you basically you use the tools, whatever um, fits the situation. And then I think that what we can do is um, then dissect that and then be like, okay, how, how, how can we actually, what happened? How could it, it had been better? And what can we do? Like, how can we put this in a, like an organized framework? So next time it's even more organized, but that way we can have like fun. We can have an outlet for um, spreading uh, what we do that people are actually interested in because you know, um, fixing corporate problems, zero people are interested in tweeting about this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but done. like, if we do, if we like jump in the mix with some like social issues that are interesting and then um, provide these tools that we're working on to give it like, to not only for it to be extremely frivolous, but it for it to be extremely serious at the same time, I'm just, Super excited about um, that I, possibility. I love the combo. And we're getting up on the end of our, our call time together for, for today's call. Um, and one thing occurs to me is that this moment has caused a lot of large corporations to try to figure out what their meaning or purpose is. Like, what on earth does that mean? Uh, how is this going to work? Uh, what the hell? Nobody taught me about meaning and purpose in, in B school, right? Uh, and it's never been in my pay uh, comp package. And, 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 and like there's, there's all, the, all these problems. We could tackle a question like that with sock puppets, with gestures, with poetry. With, we, could, we could sort of work the boundary between the dream space and the think space. Uh, we could manifest it in a, in a bunch of, however many ways anybody's inspired to do, we could put up a contest that says, hey, here's six riffs we created. Anybody else go riff on this and see what, see what shows up, right? But, but, corporations, executive suites search for meaning and purpose is a serious thing right now. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of them are, are, are clue full and many of them are clue less. Yeah. And they could, they, they would love to hunt for a clue and they don't want to miss the clue train. <clears throat> and I'm friends with the founders of, of the, the, clue, the writers of the clue train book. We can bring them into this conversation as well uh, because they're really good at expressing these sorts of things. Yeah. There's, there's a big piece of that, that purpose and, that fits with the visioning piece of corporations and some corporations have done that better than others in terms of not trying to look at externals to see a path but to look at visions of where things need to go and so there might be a rift that we could do around visioning that would engage that deeper thoughtful stuff because if you separate the vision from the action and do them discreetly differently you get different results and we're crossing over into what i think is the space of a different bucket or guild, which is more the philosophical approaches of OGM. <clears throat> and I think it's a different guild, I'm not sure, but it feels like there's a whole bunch of really interesting, meaty, yet philosophical sounding conversations to have about exactly this, like how does change happen and how does this all work and why are we here and, and, and so forth, which needs to be permeable and connected to the conversation about expressive tools and how do we make sock puppet overlays so that it's a convincing story and meme making and the, and the gesture patrol. Um, and I'm not sure part of why I'm convening these conversations is to figure out how do, how do we sort those things out so that they work together so that everybody isn't in every conversation because we don't have that kind of time and everybody is applying their joy and energy in the place where it's biggest payoff for them and for the group. And Lauren, it looks like you are dying to answer that question. No? Oh, you were, you were leaning in going. Well, I have a comment mind. because I think that there's a big difference between visioning in a philosophical sense and ideation mm -hmm. in terms of a future state. And yeah. so 
love us to spend some time on ideation because that can be graphic. It can be a lot of different things and, and it can have an action vector, but you don't have to define the vector until you get the actual ideas that you want to pursue. And you have just in words described a graphic that Matt put uh, shared on the screen at the beginning of the call when you weren't here yet. Uh, you have just described that graphic. Okay, sorry uh, I missed it, it. Great, and it'll be in the recording which I'll send out uh, today. Um, so um, same time next week and in between, uh, happy to suggest and hold a different call. Gene and I have conspired to set up a couple calls, but uh, I'll figure out how to get those announcements into the room uh, and we'll go from there. Any any closing thoughts as we wrap today's call? Uh, just that I, I think it's essential that we bring um, people who are curious about the documentation side um, and really are experts there in, into this and to allow them to listen and to produce, you know, almost to produce based on the material that we generate, right? I think it's very difficult to do, you know, to do both simultaneously. And I think we need that, that skill set in the room. Um, and I'll, I'll work on I'll work on that. I've got I got to go get some people convinced that they need to be here. Um, partly also, we just need to invite into the group people who love doing that and That's who would right love the, who would love the content of this and who have no other reason than to to be involved in stuff that that has you know meaning and purpose to them and express it. So exactly, let's, let's find those humans. Uh, Julian? Julian, I think you have a last word. Go ahead. Uh, all right. I mentioned earlier that I've been doing a survey on knowledge systems and vis uh, visualization. I'll have that later this month. I thought it might be uh, useful to send that around because this is a topic I've been tracking for the last 20 years on systems as complex as the space shuttle and uh, also trying to bring in popular concepts such as Minority Report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And, and, and Minority Report planted in many people's ideas, the heads, the idea that there's this manipulable, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> and Kevin Kelly and a bunch of other people were hired as consultants to Minority Report, and they're friends right. of our network. Um, so we can wander in that territory, and we can do it. We have connections into places like Pixar and, and whatnot. And, and um, I was having a conversation last year about some of this stuff in which he mentioned, you know, uploading your brain, and he had connections into some of the people who were busy at the forefront of that research. So uh, we can kind of go lots of interesting places. Mm -hmm. um, Charles, last word to you. Just then to quickly ask email. again about the auto transcripts. Um, I can remember, do you, you include those in the emails? Is I, that, or? Yes, I, I, put in the, I put in the chat that I'm attaching them to the emails, but I should also, which I have not been doing, drop them in our common Google Drive. Okay, because those of us who use auto, we could also have a group there that's accessible. You can share it sort of open link. That might be a nice way to do it. Um, just so if they're all in one place, that's great. Yeah, if, if they're in one place, anybody can do something with them that they want. Cool. Um, namaste, y'all. Namaste. Namaste. namaste right here. Yeah, all right. Because <laughs> we're under lockdown. But thank you. Really appreciate this conversation. Until soon. You too.